What is a data mesh? It's something that you hear about a lot these days. It seems to be a topic that is really trending and it seems to be something that has a lot to do with how to share data. And it's an interesting topic that we want to talk about today. And to talk with us today, we have uh, Simon Hara here with us. Hey, Simon, how are you doing? Hey, I'm fine. Thanks. Thanks so much for joining. Um, for a little bit of context, about six weeks ago, we had a first video, which I did with uh, Stefan Tilkov, um, where we talked about uh, the similarities between APIs and data. And, and we planned on turning that into a series where we would do um, videos on data mesh and data contracts and so forth. Um, sadly, uh, Stefan passed away about six weeks ago. And um, now I have Simon here and I'm really happy that you're here. And I'm really happy to have you here as somebody who was recommended by Stefan. And I'm, I'm sure this is what he would have wanted, that we continue the story with you as um, the, the next best thing, so to speak, as the, the um, InnoQ data mesh experts. Thanks so much for joining, Simon. Yeah, thank you. And, and I want to mention that Stefan really made it possible for me to dive deep into the data mesh topic. He believed this is an interesting topic and, and sponsored the whole effort at InnoQ and, and me as well. So he was a mentor for Data Mesh for me and this was sadly and deeply missed. Thank you. And yeah, that's very true. I mean, I, I have not seen Stefan as passionate about a topic as about mm -hmm. Data Mesh uh, in yeah. quite a while. So it's actually very interesting that we can talk about that. So let's jump in. Um, what is a Data Mesh? There has to be something like a definition. What, what do I have to think of when I hear Data Mesh? Okay, so data mesh is a concept defined by Shamak Tigani uh, in her book. Um, and it's a decentralized socio-technical approach to share and manage analytical data in complex and large scale environments within or across organizations. Full stop. That's, that's a mouthful. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. Especially the socio-technical term is, is something people stumble upon. And what it means is it's mostly an organizational issue about ownership and um, um, yeah, decentralization around that. And technology comes uh, as well, but, but it's second, not first. Yeah, and, and you cannot do it successfully by just looking at technology. So, no. so you really like that book, I know, and you like it so much that... Yeah, so it's, we, we looked at this English book and, and read it and translated it into a German version um, to make it more approachable in the German Dach market. So I think that's, that's a very good indication that you really know what you're talking about when it comes to data mesh. Um, and it is definitely a trending topic. So when we look at the foundational principle, let's say, or the pillars of data mesh. There are these four things that people typically point to or talk about when it comes to what is really important for the data mesh concept. Could you briefly walk us through those, please? Sure. So the first one is domain ownership. So the idea is um, that now instead of just owning operational data, there's also ownership around analytical data by teams. So it has been very clear. The second principle is data as a product. So the owners of their data, the analytical data, have to share their data as data products. Think of like APIs uh, for data that, um, with a product thinking mindset. So yeah, it has to be valuable. Uh, it has to be managed as a life cycle. It can also be shut down and has to be good defined. Uh, the data products should run on a self-service platform that's offered by a well, platform team, so to say, to make it easy to share data as data products to other teams. And then, well, if you have these products that are shared on the platform, you need some governance rules, some rules of play for the data mesh. And that's where the federate governance comes into play. And it's even more as a federate computational governance because um, uh, automation is key to making that work. So it's really interesting to me, you know, when I look at these four pillars, they resonate so much with me because they are so kind of very similar to what we have in the API world. And that's exactly what Stefan and I discussed yeah. uh, when we talked about this, right? That there are so many parallels, even though sometimes people use maybe different terminology, but structurally it seems to be uh, very close. Is there like, what do you think about that similarity? Is that something you find interesting or is that just a coincidence? 
No, I thought I don't think that's a coincidence. It's it's um, a data mesh about scaling. And when you think about how did we scale in the software development industry, uh, we say we have small teams with clear ownership, and they build services as products uh, and share APIs. Um, they build it on platforms, and they have macro macro architectural um, guidelines and rules that everybody has to fulfill. And it's very similar, to be honest. Yeah. So thanks for that definition, so to speak, or this overview of, of what you need. Now let's jump into the next topic that we can briefly discuss, which would be how do you turn that into action, so to speak? What would it, this, this architecture that you talked about, these, this, this, these macro mm -hmm. rules, what would those mm -hmm. look like? And there you can identify a number of teams and roles. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And if you could walk us through that model a little bit, that would be great. Yeah, think of where you want to scale the number of teams um, that, that do data analytics. So the more teams you have that do data analytics independently, the more you can gain out of your data. It's, it's the center when you look at the picture. That's where we want to scale, um, adding more teams, more responsibilities, more domains. And, and then around, we need these uh, centralized support for that. We need the centralized platform so where, you, where they can build data products and share it. Um, we need a centralized enabling team, like a center of excellence that help new teams get on that platform, build good data products uh, that, that are shared and used. And we need these rules, these global policies, and we, we use some kind of architecture decision record template for defining these rules in a governance group, gilding, like a guild, like an architectural guild, basically. And the interesting part is that these rules have to be automated by the platform because in the end, to circle back, ownership stays in the middle. You can't get, give ownership away, but you can build upon a platform that automatically implements these rules um, to, to, to automatically be compliant to these rules. Yeah, and again, another, another kind of, um, a lot of similarity, right? When you say ADR, <laughs> that resonates a lot with me. Um, platform engineering, just just did something about that, right? So, so I think again, we see a lot of these similarities, and I think that's mm -hmm. that's that's a good thing, actually, in my mind. It's something that that helps us to to validate that probably what happens here seems to be a pattern that makes sense. It, it kind of was discovered in different different application areas. Okay, so. So this is something that you can put in place. And um, as our last thing that we want to discuss, I think it helps. And, and you said before we started recording, I like that text. I brought a data mesh I, and I like that a lot. So, so if we look at these principles and then how you can turn that into something that, that produces things, now mm -hmm. let's briefly look at what it produces. So you brought a little example of what a data mesh can look like. If you could walk us through that example a little bit and explain how that works. Sure. I brought, I brought it up from an organizational point of view. No, 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 not, we didn't talk about technology because technology is not the issue here typically. It's more, um, in this case, I, I brought like a graph. The data mesh could be seen as a graph. The nodes are the data products that they are owned by the teams, by the domain teams. And the edges are basically the usage uh, relations between these data products. And here is an example of an e-commerce domain. We have the customer journey at the bottom, but it's very close to the operational system. So in this case, the product search uh, team has search queries as a data product. Um, so where, where, where you recorded what users entered in, in the search field. And that might be interesting for marketing, but also for other, other teams. And they offer it as a data product to others. Their data model is very close to the operational data model, like 95%, little bit of cleaning, a little bit of deduplication, um, maybe a little bit of transformation, but it's actually, but it's it's a historized a his, history data, uh, um, the, the data. And then on the top side, you have um, the data products and the teams with their use cases that really make cool stuff. And, and in the middle, you have this strange layer and it's always this middle management is always a little bit problematic because uh, you are, you're really in between, you get the, you have the use cases on top and they, they have a lot of issue like requests and you have to fulfill them with the, with the data products below. And for that, they are basically, they're always like 360 customer degree. Uh, they're always needed like from 
but um, it's a deliberate investment decision to really fund these teams uh, um, to, to build these uh, aggregates like the data products in the middle. And this is like, like a typical scheme of, a, of how a data mesh can, can look like from an organizational point of view. Yes. And, and again, right from the API point of view, this looks very similar to me. Um, yeah. There are a variety of organizations, I won't name any names, but who, who have proposed this kind of three layered mm -hmm. model of looking at kind of different classes or yeah, classes of APIs, you might say. Mm -hmm. So, so again, that resonates, I think a lot, but now that you have that, um, so you have these different, um, data groups, so to speak that, that create data. Um, that is being published and can be consumed, then from my point of view as an API person, I would say, how do you do that, right? So in, in the API space, we would have something like OpenAPI or Async API mm -hmm. or other standardized languages, how mm -hmm. one of those teams would expose what they're doing to the other teams. And then ideally they can just collaborate, so to speak, without actually having to speak to each other. How does that work in, in that picture? Okay, collaborating without speaking to each other mostly won't work, to be honest. <laughs> but, well, um, that's kind of the API story, right? That you say, if you say AI is working well enough, then I can use whatever that team is doing without having to ask them how it works and so forth. So, yeah. so yeah, but maybe, maybe it wasn't phrased really good. Yeah, I, I, I completely understand. It just it was so catchy. I had to. Yeah. Um, uh, the, the story is actually that there is a, uh, an effort to introduce something like a open API into the data world. The term they are using is data contracts, but they mean data contracts like open API, but for data. So, um, and, and we are also working on that. We've, we've created a, a specification. It's a proposal for for a new standard, and um, but I think that's a great topic for maybe another episode in the series. I think you're right. I, I, that sounds <laughs> super interesting to me, and I would like to to do a more of a deep dive into that because that's really in the end, right? That's what you need, I think, to scale this up. Is you need some kind of language that everybody is speaking to to be able to talk to each other. So yes, um, that that thing that you've created, what. Does it have a name yet, or what is it called? Yeah, the data contract specification, and okay. we have also a data contract studio and a data contract CLI. So it's like a, a suite of uh, around that uh, specification. Okay, I'm really curious to hear more, but we won't do that today. So for now, for today, uh, thank you so much, Simon, for being here. That was really insightful. I think it, it should help everybody to better understand what a data mesh is and, and how you can actually build up one of those. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you for uh, inviting me here. It was a pleasure. And I'll link to all the resources that you have created and that are available on the web um, in, in the description below. And with that, we're done for today. Thanks everybody for watching. If you liked it, please give it a thumbs up, consider subscribing and have a great day. Bye bye, everybody. Bye bye. Take care.